So uh, tonight what I'm going to do is we're going to look at um, a few of the symbols. We talk about this stuff all the time, and it just occurred to me that I need to kind of go through here and just and just talk a little bit about um, the the menorah and the shofar and so on and so forth and and basically link these things together so that you can see the importance of them. I know I've used the menorah and we've we've done it with the seven feasts of Leviticus 23. Um, but if you look at if you look at the um, in fact, let's just go there. Let's look at Isaiah uh, chapter 11 real quick. So Isaiah chapter 11 and we're looking at verse one. And it says, but a branch will emerge from the trunk of Yeshai. A shoot will come from his roots. The spirit of Adonai will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and fearing Adonai. And he will be inspired by fearing Adonai. And he will not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But he will judge the impoverished justly. He will decide fairly for the humble of the land, and he will strike the land with a rod from his mouth and slay the wicked with the breath or from the breath of his lips. Justice with the belt around his waist and faithfulness, the sash around his hips. And if you go on and read this, this is basically a prophecy here about, about Jesus, about Yeshua, and when he comes. And so all of these things, one of these when you look at the seven, the seven, the seven um, attributes of Yeshua, the spirit of the spirit of wisdom, uh, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of power, the fear of knowledge. Uh, I'm sorry, the spirit of knowledge, the spirit of fear. Um, all of these things will rest on him. And this would literally this is one of those things, once again, that it fills up this this menorah. And so when when we understand um, this menorah, we, we understand a couple of things. First of all, that you're always going to see uh, Jesus at the center of this. Um, not only figuratively, but, but literally as well, because this, this centerpiece, this centerpiece of the menorah, it's called the servant candle. And of course, we know that Jesus came to be the servant uh, the greatest servant, because he washed the, the feet of the disciples. We know that, that this centerpiece is all about him. And, and, of course, anything that we look at in terms of, anything we look at in terms of this menorah in, it, in and of itself is, is always about Jesus. Isaiah 11, when you look at, when you look at Leviticus 23, everything that we see about Jesus um, and these verses are are encapsulated in this menorah. So we understand that, that and we also understand that it's light. OK, we talked about this several weeks ago. And who is Jesus? He is the light of the world. Right. He is the light of the world. And that is and that is what this this menorah embodies. Now, one of the biggest things that this menorah represents and we see it in Revelation um, besides just Jesus himself, is that it represents the church or the assembly or the people of God. Okay? Um, we see it in terms of being that, but it also represents these feasts that we have been talking about so much in the book of Leviticus chapter 23. Okay? So the feasts are a huge part of this because... The feasts, they, they embody everything that God is trying to get, relay to us about not only the first coming of Jesus, but the second coming of Jesus. So there is, there is a tremendous amount of, of weight, of gravitas here when we talk about this and we look at the feasts and how it, how it lays out. And you guys have seen me do the, the visual on that and it filled up this entire board. Uh, but the feasts of Leviticus, the, the four in the spring and the three in the, in the fall, and they represent the first and second coming of Jesus. This was all designed by God. It's, it's like I've said before, it's like breadcrumbs, okay? It's like breadcrumbs that, that God left there for us to be able to follow so that we know what he's saying to us. And we do have his word, okay? We do have his word. But these are central themes throughout his word. 
All right, these are central themes throughout the entire Bible and the Word of God. And so what you have to understand is when you see this, you look at the feasts, okay? And what are, what are the feasts? The feasts are appointed times, right? It's pretty amazing when you read in the book of Matthew, when you read it in the book of Luke, when, when Mary is about to give birth, um, it, it just these are these are the little things that you never ever really pay attention to, and how much weight, how much significance is there. But this is what it literally says in the book of Matthew and the book of Luke. It says, "And when the appointed time came for Mary to give birth to Jesus, you you, you just think, well, it's just you know, it's just time for her to give birth. It doesn't say." When the appointed time came for Mary to give birth to Jesus, just to be saying it. This is literally an appointed time. This was divinely before the, I mean, inspired, divinely planned before the foundations of the world. God knew what day Jesus would be born. It was an appointed time. It was an appointment. You know, you know what I'm saying? And so when we understand this, we understand that all throughout the Bible, and through prophecy, we have appointed times, right? Now, that's important because uh, when we get to, let me think, it's, um, I'm almost 90, I'm 99.9% positive this is the right scripture verse. Psalms 81.3, it says this, it says, to blow the shofar, okay, at the appointed time. Now I'm going to explain. I'm going to explain to you what what Rosh Kadesh is in just a second. It's very simple, but it says to blow the shofar at the appointed time. All right, and I'll just put a little bit of a of a blurb. Blow shofar. Appointed time, and that's the basic of what of what it is saying there. Every time we see. Uh, one of the feasts, one of these appointed times take place, all right, we see the shofar is blown in some form or some fashion, all right? Now, and this is something that I didn't draw up here because, honestly, it's one of the hardest things to draw. Let me draw it in a different color. I'll draw it. And this is going to be the moon, okay? I don't know how to draw the moon. I know it has that big spot on it, you know, and whatever else. All right. So it kind of looks like a pimple or something, or I don't know. But anyways, this is the, I better put it up here so you know what in the world it is. The moon. I drew a better Ark of the Covenant than I did a moon. I mean, go figure. I don't know how that works out. But the moon, the moon cycles is how they keep all of this, okay? So, and I'm going to link all this together for you because I really want you to see the importance of all of these things and how they work together. The feasts, the menorah, and then you come to the, you come to the shofar. And when you get to the shofar, it talks about, and this is not just the only verse, but Psalms 81.3, blow the shofar at the appointed time. In this particular case, it is Rosh Kodesh. Now, is anybody familiar? I haven't done anything, I don't think, any teaching on this, but anybody studies, has anybody read anything about Rosh Kodesh? You have? Tell me about Rosh Kodesh. Yes. That's exactly right. Exactly right. So what they did was they blew the shofar at the first day of every month to announce the beginning of the new month, to announce the, um, to announce the new moon. And I'm going to show you something in just a second that I discovered too. Remind me to tell you guys about the hidden day, Rosh Hashanah, and how it, how it correlates with Rosh Kadesh. But this is the first day of every month, and the shofar is blown, and that time, that first day of every month is an appointed time. All right. Now they, yes, sir. Yeah, the first day of the month, first day of the month, and the new moon. 
and they, those two things correspond. So the, the first day of the month, the new moon, and they would blow the shofar to let everybody know uh, that that was the first day of the month. And they would, it, it's, it's a festival of sorts. They would, they would celebrate it in terms of they might have a special dinner or that sort of thing. There were a few different things that they did, but it wasn't um, anywhere near like the Sabbath, um, the weekly feast, or the, the annual feasts that take place uh, in the spring and the fall. So, but it is very important because it marks the beginning of every month. And without Shabbat, Sabbath, without the weekly, once a week, okay, on Friday evenings going into Saturday evenings, without that in Rosh Kodesh, they have no way of marking the times and then understanding when the major feasts take place, right? And... So it's all about, it's all about, and this is, this is, if I can just draw the parallel here, because it, it frustrates me, not, it doesn't make me mad, it just frustrates me because I, I want to say, do you not understand? I want to shake somebody when they say, why is it so important to be so consumed with talking about end times and so on and so forth? And my first response is always, well, you want to ignore a third of the Bible, first of all, over 10,000 scriptures that, that talk about nothing but end times. So we just want to leave that out and only focus on two-thirds of the Bible, which is an abomination. Because what does the Bible say? Whoever adds or takes away from this word, yeah, not good stuff. It's not good. God does not look kindly on it. The second thing is, is we are supposed to know the times we are living in. The Hebrew people live their life understanding the importance of every day. Understanding when the new moon was. Every weekly Sabbath. And they understood that those things led them to the even bigger feasts that they had to make sure. They, why? Because they were awaiting. They always were awaiting the coming of the Messiah. They were always looking for Him. See, the Jews didn't do what we do. We just we don't want to talk about the coming of Jesus. We just want to have church. Jews didn't have church. They didn't, they studied the Torah and they did all of these things for one purpose. When is Messiah coming? When will he appear? That was what they were always looking for. That's what they were always doing. So this this shofar. This shofar is connected to all of this because without it, they don't know the beginning of any of this stuff. Y'all with me? So this is, this is like, if we can start putting in some terms now that will kind of lock into our brain, this is like a clock. Y'all with me? This shofar is like an alarm, right? This is part of the clock. You got like hours, you got like minutes and second hands, then you got the alarm. If I, it, how many of you have to get up at a certain time tomorrow? Every one of you. Tell me, tell me some times you have to get up. 6.30s, 5.30, 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock. So how many of you know that if Jamie sets his time for 6 o'clock, like some of you have to get up, when he has to get up at 5, he's going to be late. He's going to be late, right? I mean, I know this is real basic stuff, but just follow me here. All right? I promise you this is going to make sense. He's going to be late. If Jamie sets, because why? Because that is not his appointed time. It's not his appointed time. Some of you have to get up at 5.30. That's your appointed time. Some of you have to get up at 6. That's your appointed time. If you miss the appointed time, you're late. And guess what? Are, all, are you starting to pick up on this? If you miss the appointed time, you're late. And you don't want to be late because guess what? If you're late too many times, you know, you're, you're canned. You're out the door. If it's like BMW, uh, I think you can be late like once. And then after that, 
you are cast out into utter darkness. I mean, they do not, they do not play with tardiness at BMW, all right? So, so you have to set your alarm so that you can make sure you get up. It's not just enough. Y'all watch me. It's not just enough to have a clock. Are y'all with me? The alarm lets you know when certain things are happening with that clock. So even if I am just waiting for the feasts and I'm waiting for these things, how will I know unless I have an alarm? I've got one that takes place weekly. I've got one that takes place monthly. And then I have an alarm that takes place seven times a year to alert me to the feasts that are going to take place. If I don't have the alarm set, if I'm not watching the clock, guess what I miss? Just take a stab. You may, you bet, but who, let me say, who am I going to miss? Jesus. I'm going to miss Jesus. I'm going to miss the appointed time for him to come. And these feasts are all about him. All of these times are about him. The clock is set. It says it in Genesis 1.14. Signs, seasons, days, and years. And this show far lets us know about the specific times, the specific days uh, during the year. And there's not just these things, but then there are also, uh, and we haven't even talked about this a lot, but then there's the cycle of the, the, the Shemitah cycle, which is the, the Sabbath year. Every seven that takes place every seven years. And there's a certain so shofar that's blown for that that you have to be aware of. And so all of these things take place, all right, in conjunction with one another. So you have, you have a clock. You have a clock. You can write it down however, however you want to, second, minute hand, whatever else, okay? And then you have the alarm, all right? So this tells me of the events, all right? This helps me to keep time for those events. And this blows the alarm to let me know exactly when they take place, right? So that is extremely important. Now, I'm going to throw in a little, I'm going to throw in a little something that, that um, I haven't taught any of you guys yet, all right? This is pretty awesome. And I have taught, a I should say it like this, I've taught about it, but I haven't taught this part of it. Okay, so at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, remember the 48-hour remember the day that we talked about? It's the first two days of the last 10 days of awe, um, of the 40 days, the last 10 days, 10 days of awe. Those, those two days that are run together, okay, um, I did some more study and I found out something that I had never seen before. And this is pretty amazing. It's just, it's really incredible. Because when they're going to blow the shofar at the beginning of Rosh Hashanah, the, the, the awakening blast for the feast to begin, they call it the hidden day, all right? They call it the day when no man knows the hour. Very interesting. I've, I stumbled across this in some reading and in some studying. I was, I was trying to find something in the Talmud and I ended up coming across this because there's a whole section in the Talmud that talks about nothing more than Rosh Hashanah, believe it or not. And so when I stumbled across this, I was blown away because Rosh Kadesh is a monthly thing and it is an appointed time. The calendar is set for this day. All right. There is no mistake about it. All right. But there's an interesting thing that takes place. Uh, during the time of Rosh Hashanah is because, and it's because of this, there isn't, there isn't a set day for Rosh Hashanah, all right, for a couple of reasons. One is because they don't know exactly when that harvest will start, the fall harvest, all right? So they give a little leeway. Also, there are many a times a Sabbath that takes place uh, and or a Rosh Kadesh, okay, that's taking place, I'm sorry, Rosh Kadesh is taking place at the same time. So you have an appointed time 
right at the very, and this, this is the only feast this happens with, because every other feast is like at full moon. This is the only feast that takes place during the new moon, and so it, it, it coincides with Rosh Kadesh. So they're looking for the new moon to blow the monthly shofar for Rosh Kadesh, but they also have to blow a shofar for uh, Rosh Hashanah that happen exactly at the same time. All right? So what they do is, so they don't miss, this is why they call it, this is the biggest reason why they call it the long day and why they make it a 48-hour day. So they don't miss either one of them. They just draw out the first day of the month into two so that they can sound the alarm both for Rosh Kadesh because you can't not do it. Y'all with me tonight? You can't not do it. And then they have to also blow the shofar for Rosh Hashanah that are literally like this. They're just taking place at the exact same time. So they draw the first day out into two and call it the long day. I never knew why they called it the long day, but that's why they do it. So that they don't miss any alarm for any uh, this is how important it was to keep the times and to understand where you were in time, where you were on the calendar, because if you don't, you will miss Jesus. You'll miss Yeshua. You'll miss his coming. All right. So uh, the whole Bible is just laced with laced with this idea of keeping watch, the watchman on the wall. Don't don't fall asleep. Be sober. Be vigilant. Your enemy is like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It puts new meaning to all of these things. We're not just talking about an enemy who wants to kill, steal, and destroy you, but we're talking about an enemy who wants to keep you blind to when the coming of, of Yeshua is. Are you guys with me tonight? So he doesn't, he doesn't want you to know. He doesn't want you to be paying attention. He doesn't want you to keep the feast. He doesn't want you to look at all of this stuff because then you will be like those folks in the days of Noah, going about your business and forgetting about all that's happening around you, right? And, and so this is extremely important. Now, I got one last drawing on here, and we're almost done. I got one last drawing on here, and... Now, you guys, you guys throw me a bone here, all right? What is that right there? Ark of the Covenant. You know what that means? I drew it well. <laughs> if you're able to identify it, I drew it well. All right, so inside, inside the Ark of the Covenant, you have uh, Aaron's rod that budded. Look, I even put buds on it. Isn't that awesome? They're nice and green. They budded. Aaron's rod that budded. Inside is the, is the pot of manna, and then also the mitzvot, or the ten, the ten Commandments, all right, that are inside the Ark of the Covenant. Um, the, the Ark of the Covenant contains these things, but what is the Ark of the Covenant in and of itself representative, and what did it actually hold? God's presence, exactly. All right. Now, this is amazing because, and I hope you grab the, the importance of it. You may have to write it down and go home and think about it and, and ponder on it, all right? But in, the, in the, the tabernacle, in the temple, in the wilderness tabernacle and also in the temple, and um, Chuck, you might have some things you want to interject after we get done with this here. But inside of that, inside of that tabernacle, if I just drew a, a quick, a quick, um, just overhead view of this, all right. This is the ark. Right here, is a menorah. All right. Up here is what they refer to as the brazen altar. Over here, over here was the table with the showbread.
And then, of course, this is the veil. This is the Holy of Holies. And this was... This was basically the temple on earth, okay? The temple of heaven. It's a, it's a representation of what we have in heaven. This would be the throne of God, okay? And this would be his courts, all right? In fact, it's referred to by David as the courts. Uh, um, and, and then, of course, there is the gates that, take, that, are, that are up here. The gates, it's pretty interesting. I didn't really plan on doing this much to it but let me just show you this real quick the gates are at they face they face the east all right all around all around this this temple were encamped the 12 tribes of Israel all right at the east gate the tribe that was encamped there was Judah does anybody know what Judah means Judah Praise. Pretty amazing that David said, I will enter your gates. With thanksgiving, I will enter your courts with praise. It's no mistake. Judah is strategically placed there because you do not enter the gates of God's courts without two things, without thanks and without praise. Right? Right? I could do a teaching on that, just that right there for the next hour about thanksgiving and praise and entering the courts, the gates, and the courts. All right, so we come in. All of these things, all of these things are all Jesus. Even the, even the poles that went down uh, that held up, it's an overshot view here, but there's, there's posts here that held up the, and there was a certain number of them, a very specific number. The rope was made out of camel's hair. The, the nails were brass. All of this represents Jesus because the, the, the brass nails, does anybody know what brass is representative of in, uh, in terms of Jesus? It's representative of suffering. The nails that went into his hand, our suffering Savior, Okay. The um, camel's hair, you know what it means? Camel's hair is profit. Every last piece of the temple, right down to the nails that just hold rope, you think it looks like it's just holding up the tent. It all had symbolic meaning. It was all Jesus, 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 Yeshua, 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 everywhere. The brazen altar, when the lamb would finish burning, there was constantly sacrifice of a lamb that was burning on the altar. Um, and when it would fall through, when the last coal would fall through, the, the priest that stood in the yard, the priest that stood in the yard would say, It is finished! And they would put another lamb up on the brazen altar. So there was constantly an offering. You know what the Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 13 and 15? And remember, it's right there at the beginning where you enter the courts with praise. Hebrews 13, 15 says, And let the praise of God continuously be on, continuously burn on your lips. That is the fruit of your lips, giving thanks unto His name. Right? So, so you, you, you even see in 13, 15 of Hebrews where we're looking at the, the, the front end of the, of the temple. Right? It's amazing. And then the showbread. Jesus is the bread of life. He's the bread without sin. This is Jesus. It's the seven feasts of Leviticus 23. That's what it represents right here in this, in this uh, show. And then you go into the Holy of Holies and this is the presence of God. My, my point in showing you all of this is that how can we understand or know or live in God's presence if we don't know his feasts, if we don't know his appointed times, if we don't watch the clock and we don't know when the alarm is set? Because it's all in his temple. If it's in his temple and we are the temple, is anybody in this place? 
if we are the temple, then, then how in the world? We are a temple that is a wreck if we don't understand these things and they're not properly placed in our lives. It's powerful. It's absolutely powerful. Um, oh, I was going to say something else, and it slips my mind because I got so many things going through my head. What was it? What was it? Yes, thank you very much. This is the last thing. The, the alarm is very, is very significant, okay? But in, in terms of the shofar, but I want to tell you something. If we, are, if, we are, if we are the temple, okay, then, then let me give you a little bit of, let me give you a little bit of understanding in who we are and in Jesus and how this fits in, okay? Because all of this should be in our hearts and not inside of a temple anymore. We should understand and keep the feasts in our hearts. We should know who Jesus is. We should enter his courts with thanksgiving, or his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. We should understand the feast, keep them in our heart. We should know that he is the bread of life and eat of his word on a daily basis. Do you not see how all of these things are leading to living in the presence of God? And guess what the alarm is? The alarm is your mouth. The alarm is your mouth that when I wake up, I have constantly let the praise of God continuously be on my lips. That is the fruit of my lips, giving thanks unto His name in everything that I do and everywhere that I go. I will bless the Lord. His praise will always be in my heart. His praise will always be in my lips. Everywhere that I go, my mouth is a shofar to let people know of the love and the power of Jesus Christ. I am so and I am light, but I am not silent. My salt and the light that bears witness in me of Jesus has a voice. It's my mouth. And everywhere I go, I'm sounding the alarm that He is the, the way, the truth, the life. He is the feast. He is the, the lamb. He is the altar. He is the bread. He is the presence of God. He is the doorway to God's presence. My mouth is the shofar. My mouth is the sounding piece. I've talked about this before in praise and worship. That, and this is why praise and worship is so important. We have got to move beyond the understanding that praise and worship is just something that I grab a book or I look at a, or I look at a, a screen and we are just supposed to sing a few songs before we go into the Word of God. The enemy, and this is what people don't know, if he was, people call him the praise and worship leader. Can I tell you who he was? He was like that shofar. He was a being that emanated sound. All right? And listen, watch this. Before every move of God, before every feast of God, there is a sound that precedes it. I literally told you everything I told you tonight to tell you this one thing. Before every feast, before every new moon, before everything that God does, there is a sound. A sound that precedes His move. A sound that precedes His moving. A sound that precedes His feasts. A sound that precedes His coming. Jesus will not come unless first there is a sound of a shofar, the sound of God, the last trump of God that blasts, and He will descend on clouds of glory with a shout and with a sound, with a blast from the shofar. Before everything that God does, there is a sound that precedes it. Do you know why there is so little movement of God in His people? Is because there is so little sound to precede His move. We want God to move, but we have no brazen altar in our heart. There is not a fruit of praise and thanksgiving all the time in us. Listen, when I, when I come in here, just me, myself, I sit down to the keyboard and I'll worship for an hour, hour and a half all the time. Almost every day I come in here, 
Okay? Sometimes more than once a day. Wherever I am, I'm always singing in my heart. I'm always praising God. Why? Because I always want God to be moving in my life. And he doesn't move without a sound that precedes it first. If Satan was, if ha Satan was an, a being that emanated sound, he announced God's move. He was cast out of heaven, and then God created you and I. We are the sound that precedes God's every move. When we start out with service and we enter in his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise and worship, that is saying to God, we want you to move. It's not something to fill up an hour. Lord knows I would just preach and let you all go home. <laughs> Are you all with me? But it is something that sets up the receiving of his word. Are you all with me tonight? I can't get to here unless I've gone through here first. I get his word, I get who he is, and he is the key to God's holy place. Absolutely powerful. We have got to be the voice, not only in here, but we've got to be the voice outside of these four walls. If there is going, listen y'all, I'm so, uh, can I just preach for a second? I, I, you know, I saw again the other day somebody was talking about people being filled with the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, and they, and they deemed it revival. That is not revival. It's not. And I don't care who wants to sit down and argue with me. I don't care if a thousand people got baptized in water and filled the Holy Ghost. It's not revival. It's just supposed to happen. It's what's in the Word. Are you all with me? I'm trying to liken it to something. We, we call things something that they're not. But being filled with the Holy Ghost is part of your walk with Jesus. It's part of your walk with God. It's not a revival. It's just supposed to happen. All right? It's just what is supposed to be. A revival is this. A revival, if we want to understand it, a revival in terms of what we understand it to be, it's an awakening. Okay? A revival does not take place amongst believers who already have the Holy Spirit and who know who Jesus is. A revival is when those people, oh my gosh, when those people go outside the four walls and they become the shofar, they become the sound that precedes a move of God. And what is that move? Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about Yeshua HaMashiach. He is the one who was and is and is to come. Behold, he was dead. They crucified him, but he is alive forevermore. And I want to tell you something. He is coming back again one day on the clouds of glory. Are you ready? Can I pray with you so that you receive Jesus Christ? That is a revival. I'm telling you right now that the revival that people are waiting on, they're waiting for another Brownsville, they're waiting for another Toronto, it's not going to happen because God's waiting for us to be salt and light. The next revival is taking place at Bilo. The next revival is taking place at Walmart. The next revival is taking place at Sam's Club. It's taking place in the parking lot. It's taking place in the aisles. It's taking place in front yards of people's homes. It's taking place in corporate America at the top of, of skyscrapers. It's taking place in restaurants and chilies and fats. It's taking place wherever people are willing to be a sound that precedes a move of God. That is revival. That is a move of God. You know what a revival is? A revival is what's taking place in the Middle East right now where hundreds and even thousands of Muslims are having dreams about a man whom we know as Jesus that tells them they are wrong and they're worshiping a false god and brings correction to them and then reveals himself as Jesus and they get saved in their dream. That's revival. Revival is the hundreds and even thousands of Jews that are returning to Israel and they're finding Yeshua HaMashiach as their Lord and Savior once they return there. That's revival. 
Why do we think it's all about us and God give us another Brownsville? I'm telling you what right now, God's not going to give us another Brownsville. God wants us to give him a revival. Are you all with me tonight? God wants us to give him souls, add to the kingdom, possess the land, and walk about like we are people of a kingdom that's not of this world. Our voice is the shofar that precedes the move of God just like it always has. And we're supposed to have His feasts in our heart, be watching for His coming. We're supposed to have praise and thanksgiving on our lips at all times. We're supposed to eat daily of His portion, the portion of His Word, the Torah, Him, Jesus. And then if we do those things, guess what? We live in God's presence. There are people asking to live in God's presence, but they don't want to do, because once you get here, that's where the commandments are. And you can't even get to there without obeying the commandments out here. But people want the presence of God. They want the blessing of God. But they don't want to do anything that it requires to have it or to get there. And the church at large has taught fallacies in terms of how to get the blessing, how to get his favor, and how to walk in his presence. I don't have to sow a thousand dollar seed to walk in God's presence. I got to keep his commandments. Live with praise and thanksgiving in my heart. Eat of his word daily. Obey his commandments and favor of God will be on me. His presence will be all around me. It will go before me and it will come behind me. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And what? And I will live and dwell in his presence forever. All right. I had no idea I was going to come in here and start shouting and preaching. But I'm just passionate. We have got, I don't know, I'll, I'll be repeating myself, but we have got to be a voice. We have got to be the sound that precedes God's word, his move, and everything that he wants to do. And we have a, we've got to have these things in our heart. They are symbolic, okay, but they're also important to understand and to look at them and to see them daily. To understand, to understand his feast, to understand the shofar, what it means, and to understand how all of these things live in us and how we're supposed to walk about. Because we are the temple now, right? But I don't want to be a temple that is bereft of God's presence. I don't want to be a temple that has nothing burning on the altar. I don't want to be a temple that doesn't have his word freshly implanted into my life daily. It's pretty amazing when uh, after David's, I think it was after David's son died, he, he, he messed everybody up because he went, he in, he went into the temple and he literally ate the showbread off the table, like physically ate it. And David was, of course, the first Pentecostal he embodies everything that we are. Are you all with me? <laughs> so, so he's just crazy to begin with. But David went in and he ate the bread because he's like, what is it there for? You know what he was prophetically saying? What is it there for? What is it there for? We're supposed to eat it. We're supposed to intake of it daily. Amen? All right. I'm going to let you guys go. Is there any questions? Any thoughts? Yes, that's right. Oh, my gosh. It is. It is. The altar of incense is in here as well. Let me tell you, just real quick, let me tell you about the altar of incense. Exodus talks about this. It talks about, I'm trying to remember the names, the Galbon and the Anks Yun or something like that. And these are all parts of a lamb that had died that they had used for sacrifice and they used these parts of the lamb they ground them down all right 
What I'm about to say, I hope you, I hope you get this. This is power because this is powerful. And you're right. I'm so glad you mentioned it. But the altar of incense is in there, and the incense they used, they used these ground down parts of the lamb. All right, and when they burned them, they had a sweet smell to them. But something had to die in order for there to be incense. And if you're going to be incense to God, something in you has to die so Jesus can live, so that we can smell good to them. See, sometimes we go down to altars and we're going through pain and we're going through stuff and everything else, and we want God to deliver us from the very thing He's using to make us a sweet incense so that He can breathe us in. You know why? Because trouble purifies it is a sanctifier. It is a sanctifier. You, that's why some people, you, they, you have to get to the bottom of the barrel before they turn around because they have, to, they have to go through trouble before they turn around and look at God and say, oh God, I'm here finally. We have to be broken just like those pieces of the end. Something has to die. And once we finally die, and let me tell you what, a voluntary death is easier than one that's forced upon us through life, all right? When we lay at the altar. But once we die to our ambitions and our flesh and our desires and all of those things, okay, then we become a sweet incense, a sweet-smelling savor unto God. Thank you so much.